bar top video game cabinets. Uh, actually, just curious curiosity of me, I want to know how many of you know what that is. Awesome. Awesome. I guess you probably wouldn't be here otherwise. Uh, favorite game, Erotic Photo Hunt, everyone? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. So uh, just a little background about me. Uh, I'm an offensive security consultant uh, by day. I work as a contractor now. My favorite things to work on there are probably net pen and physical penetration tests. Uh, my last job is with uh, Acuvant Labs, but uh, now I'm indie. So if you want to hire me, let me know. <laughs> In my spare time, uh, I love to hack hardware. Uh, I found it like, very fun and rewarding uh, to learn about uh, how these things work under the hood. Uh, last year I did a presentation at Black Hat uh, about the BLE key, which is a device that uh, uh, my co-creator and I uh, created to interface Bluetooth low energy with Wiegand, which is the access control protocol used to uh, let people into most commercial buildings nowadays and, and office spaces. And basically with that device you can uh, use your cell phone to open doors and get, get the data needed to clone cards. Uh, so I found, and, and, and I, I mentioned that because that's also uh, technology that's from like the Apollo moon landing era. And uh, the, these mega touch bar units are not that old. I will switch out my mic, one sec. Okay, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, but they are from around 1997. I found that this kind of stuff, I really like hacking on it because it's uh, a lot simpler than the technology today, less complex, so the, the core concepts are the same. Uh, so it's pretty easy to understand and then apply to technologies you know, that are in use today. So this is what my desk looks like most of the time. And I feature this photo because the Sailey Logic probe there, which is uh, this guy obviously, it's right there. And then the bus pirate is used prominently in this work. Uh, so one night I was at the bar with a friend playing some photo hunt and uh, the machine had to be rebooted and I saw this screen, <laughs> which uh, I was really excited about. Uh, everyone knows that's Linux, right? Right away. Uh, so at, at the time, those units were still like widely in bars and I couldn't afford one, but fast forward a couple of years to a couple of months ago and I'm trolling Kijiji uh, and the rest is history. I have two of them in my basement now. Uh, the one I got running was a DOS-based one, but uh, functionally it's very similar. They just kind of at one point decided to use Linux because they realized that DOS was probably uh, going to go the way of the dodo. So uh, I, I found the best way for me to get engaged with the project, if you're getting into hardware hacking, is anyone new to it or never done it? Cool, is to find something like this that you kind of know and love and uh, you'll care about it when you play with it. You'll, you'll feel it's, it's like more rewarding. So for those that, that haven't seen it, this is like a typical screen of, a, of the, the video game once it boots up and you can choose your game. And there's probably 100 different games or so uh, on, on the device. So as I said, I'm into cheesy games. I once had a cat-themed birthday party. Uh, I grew up in the 80s and my first PC was a Commodore 64. Uh, first game system, Sega Master System, and my favorite game of all time is Galaga. So I'm a bit fascinated with 8-bit uh, stuff. Not, uh, that's, what this, that's not what this is, but anything that's uh, kind of generally obsolete gives me a little bit of nostalgia. So I didn't really think this would be a good talk when I started because I was like, this is just something I'm interested in. Um, but then I got going along and realizing what I was doing. I'm like, hey, this, this would be kind of cool to describe to someone to, that really wants to get into hardware hacking because it's really, as I said, accessible stuff that uh, can help you understand the basics. So I'm going to go over today basic uh, poking and prodding of the Mega Touch hardware uh, in which we'll find the custom ISA I.O. card that uh, they designed or they had designed for them. And then there's a hardware key inside each Mega Touch that uh, when a new version of the software came out, they would, re they would replace, they would send it out with this hardware key, and you needed that to make the software run. Uh, and so that's going to be part of what we're talking about, of course, because I wanted to, 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 to copy those keys, essentially, because the, the systems are no longer supported, but I'll get into that later. So from there, for those keys, we go into protocol sniffing with the logic analyzer that I showed you, and uh, then looking at the 
stream of bytes from the protocol and reversing that to find the password that we password that we need to copy the keys. And then we do some development of custom Python code for interfacing with the bus pirate that I mentioned, which is a universal serial device. What well, kind of universal? It's kind of like a Swiss Army knife for dumping the keys and potentially then uh, writing them to new keys if we wanted to do that. And this all seemed appropriate because uh, this is Vegas, kind of land of cheesy games. So I was going, doing some research for this, and I came up with this quote, an arcade-like game cabinet for sad, lonely men who don't have iPhones. And this guy goes on to say, the good news is Megatouch went out of business in January. The bad news is that doesn't mean they cease to exist. So this guy's a comedian. I think he's like tongue in cheek with this stuff. But this guy, I looked him up. He was born in 2005. He spent two years in the bars without an iPhone, which means he was drunk because those are the first two years you spent really drunk in bars <laughs> and the rest of the time. So he doesn't understand what the, the novelty of this was. Uh, and I certainly do because I was way too scared to approach you know, women in bars, so I hid behind these screens playing these stupid games. So uh, anyway, he goes on again and says, the machines offer a bizarre mix of smartphone game ripoffs, which I don't understand because these were created way before smartphones, um, and, and uh, bizarrely outdated laggy interfaces, which great, of course they are because they're from 97. Uh, so about two years ago, Merit's bar top business ceased production, uh, putting these cabinets firmly in the class of uh, antiquated video games, and I guess I looked it up, they're called, it's called Abandonware, so they just kind of said, hey, we're not supporting it anymore, do what you will, but it, you're, you're on your own. So that's what really piqued my interest here. I should clarify, what I'm doing here is an effort to preserve these games, uh, not to skirt copyright law. Uh, there's a provision that was actually added to the DMCA a little while ago, you probably heard of it, for, for online games that required a license server to run, that they would, and, and, and they made a provision for preservationists to, to allow to circumvent those measures. I think this is kind of in the same vein, at least I hope there's no one in here that thinks otherwise. <laughs> so uh, when I first got the game, of course, I went right into the, there's a little button on the inside of the unit that uh, allows you to go into the menu, because I'd never seen that before. And there was some pretty funky, funny fe uh, features in there. But that, that's not what we're, we're looking uh, at today. I just thought I'd show you that. Uh, here's the inside of the unit. It uh, turns out it's just a big 150 pound uh, computer. Uh, Maybe more, I didn't actually weigh it, but I, I carried it up the stairs from where I bought it and I almost killed myself. As you can see, it's pretty thick, uh, heavy gauge metal. So most of the space is taken up by the old CRT, so uh, be careful if you try to probe around these things, high voltage uh, in, in those old CRTs. But the rest of it is uh, run-of-the-mill Pentium along with uh, proprietary ISA card that I mentioned that handles the I.O. Uh, and there's some funky connectors and stuff like this Centronics connector, I believe that's what it's called, that was used for updates to plug in a CD-ROM easier. And the iMac came out a year after this, which makes this thing look pretty funny if you think about that. So uh, smoking is bad, I learned. Uh, this was in a bar for like 10 years and it stank really badly, so I had to give it a good, a good cleaning. Uh, I had some acetone lying around for when I thought I was gonna etch PCBs on my own, and it came in handy for cleaning uh, the crap from like, the contacts from the edge connectors and stuff on this, on this unit. So this is really kind of the centerpiece of, of the only custom hardware in, in the whole Megatouch uh, uh, unit, and uh, it's pretty simple actually. Uh, how did I figure out this was the I, an I.O. card? Uh, well, first the internet told me because I Googled it, but then I also took a closer look myself at uh, the components on the board to see what they were. So uh, this guy right here is a PC card connector. And I wasn't sure what it was at the time, but you can very clean, clearly see the Cirrus Logic badge on it and, then, and the etching on the chip. So pretty simple, just Google. and. Uh, there we go, we have the data sheet. It's, it's usually the first uh, hit when, when you're Googling things like that. If not, maybe go on to the second line. Uh, these parts are very commonly used. They're not gonna invent their own parts, so chances are it's on the internet already. And pretty easy to understand given its age. Uh, so next, found a sound blaster on board by doing the same thing. And next to it, uh, 
a little amplifier because the speaker was built in, so they didn't want to have an external amp, so they put an amp on board as well. Cool. We're getting through this board pretty quickly. Uh, I was confused by this one at first because I didn't know where all this was going. I thought maybe it was uh, expansion, but this is actually just an ISA bus debug from uh, the old Pentium days, and I, I found out uh, that by turning the board right over, and you can see all the traces go to the PCB edge connector, which uh, it's just common sense from there. Uh, the board looks like it was probably used in like all of their machines. These guys do more than just bar top gaming. So there's so many unpopulated uh, headers and whatnot on this board that it could have been used for all kinds of things. Uh, okay, and this is the I button key. The focus on most of this research and uh, what was required, as I said, to make each version of the software work. Uh, so the keys are somewhat broken already. I should mention that one of my kind of heroes, uh, Joe Grand, did a talk on them at, I believe it was DEF CON or Black Hat a long time ago. And uh, Joe found a password uh, guessing, a, a dictionary attack against these things because when uh, you supply, I should mention actually first, they have encrypted information on them. And when you supply them with a password, they're supposed to spit out the encrypted information. If the password's not correct, they send out random data. So thing is the data is not random, it's calculated with a mathematical equation. So uh, knowns, uh, you, can, you, you know the output based on the input, so you can basically tell if it's the wrong password or not using one guess. But I wasn't really interested in doing that because there's like a trillion possible combinations. Uh, the only feasible attack against that is kind of a dictionary attack, and if it's not a dictionary word, you're out of luck. So let's move on. Uh, what else can we do with it? Well, we look up the data sheet again and uh, we see that it uses the one-wire protocol. So they have a secure uh, ROM for the key, but a completely clear text protocol communicating with the ROM. I'm not quite sure why they used the secure ROM, but uh, they did. So cool, it stores uh, 1,152 bits of data in three separate storage areas that are called subkeys. Uh, the secure memory cannot be deciphered without the matching 64-bit password. Passwords can be different for each area. And uh, there's also a 512-bit scratch pad, which is stored in the clear on this ROM and uh, accessible without any key. And the IDs of each of the subkeys, they, they can give them names, are also accessible. So we need all that. We need a lot of that information when we're doing the duplication. So I figured I'd mention it. There's only two contacts to hook up one of these guys, and I'll pull it out right now because I have it here. Bottom of my bag. Sorry about that. So it's pretty simple. You've probably seen these things before. They're used for other purposes as well. But yeah, two contacts, parasitically powered, which means that there's ground and power and data in the same line. So when we boot up, we uh, see some information about the key. Uh, the Mega Touch iBot had intermittent problems reading the key. Uh, even after I cleaned it with the acetone, I, it boots sometimes, it says the key's fine, and other times it just goes in a continual loop. Which is one of the reasons uh, why I wanted to do this work, because we need to preserve these things. Well, that's arguable, but I think we need to preserve these things. So <laughs> the lifespan of this uh, I button or DS1991 uh, was reported to be over 10 years. So right now this one's 20 years old and it's still working, which is pretty cool. Um, but in order to get, if we want these things to remain around working, we probably either need to hack the software, which is kind of complex and messy because there's so many versions, or just come up with a way to circumvent the, this key. So as you see, there's, there's even still a market on eBay for these things. Lots of them end up being about 30 bucks Canadian shipped. Um, and uh, hopefully the, the aim that I wanted to, to do here was build a repository of them. So if you legitimately have one of these things and your, your machine is broken, you can just go and download it and uh, write it to a new I button and you're good to go. So uh, this is how I started with uh, snipping this bus, and right here, you know, here's the I button. I just kind of jammed a, uh, uh, a jumper in, in between, a jumper cable in between both contacts, 
And then I used, is anyone familiar with logic analyzers? Cool, okay. So I use Sailey, which is a really cool little device, 100 bucks, and it does, it, it'll de decipher all kinds of protocols. And what it does is it will plot voltage over time in uh, like ones and zeros, because it's not analog, so it doesn't have a curve. But uh, as you can see up there, uh, that's what we have. And if you tell it this, on this line, it's uh, I squared C or, or spy or uh, uh, one wire, it will try to decipher based on the data that it's got on that line. So I wanna show you actually the logic capture now. So this is the, oh, and I need to turn this off. All right. Awesome. So this is what it looks like. And the, I believe it's the, the long pulses where there's, it's, it's high, the high signal is a one. It turns out to be, there's eight bits here at each one of these, it turns out to be a one. And the, uh, the short pulses here, the, the low, the mostly lows is zero. So then you have like, you have like five ones and two zeros there that make up the, the hex uh, over there and I'm cut off. But anyway, as you can see, we have a ton of data from, that, I, that I read when I turned on the device here. It's not super useful in this format, but we've properly decoded it now and we can save it and do whatever. The cool thing is, is we can export it uh, to Excel, which is what I did next. So let me get back to, if you have any questions, feel free to jump in while I'm uh, doing this here, please. Cool, okay, so on the other side that was cut off, what you didn't see, there's also like a display of commands because there's built-in commands in the language that are standard. So it'll say like, oh, this is a read-ROM command, which which it, it knows, and, uh, uh, but, but the proprietary commands of the 1991 we had to uh, figure out ourselves. So again, we have to go back to the data sheet. And that's what a lot of uh, you know, this hardware hacking stuff I found is. It's just like pretty common sense, go to the internet, read the data sheet a lot, read the data sheet again because it's confusing, and so on, and repeat. So here's the memory map. Uh, I said it has three regions. Uh, in the DS 1991, obviously there's a password, ID, and unsecured data. That's the, they call that the scratch. Uh, this data sheet is actually quite easy to read. It's a pleasure. Most of them kind of suck, and uh, for the more modern technologies are really difficult to understand. I'm not an engineer, so uh, I have to lean on my friends who are. This is a walk in the park by comparison. Uh, so what, now we have a visual representation, we know we want to dump those areas, we have the data. Now let's get familiar with the command set. So, because we need to know that in order to decipher the data. So they've provided a really detailed flowchart for how to use this thing. Uh, and let's look at the first example um, uh, Megatouch does in the, the, the command capture that I took. Uh, if you were play, paying close attention when I showed you the logic dump, uh, you saw that the first real commands that were sent to the I button uh, from the machine was hex 33, which is up there, 33H, that's what that means. You send, there's a master and a slave, the, the um, Megatouch acts as the master, this little guy acts as the slave. So uh, the master sends the read rob command, the DS1991 sends the family code back, and then six bytes for the serial number, and then it sends a CRC. Okay, so, I want, wanted to go through the Excel, first of all, to make sure that things were saying I got a good data capture and that, um, and that I, I understood this properly. And turns out, I actually did. So here on the left, you see this, the, the data sheet. On the right, you can see my Excel that I was just marking up. So we've got a TX, transmit from the master, and then we've got the RX, so we know that the serial number is that, we know that the, the, the family code is, is correct. And they probably do this on the mega touch side because they want to make sure that the, you know, things are sane on the bus and they want to see that you're using a ROM with the correct serial number. So uh, what's next? We know the comms are captured correctly. Well, we have to get familiar with more of the commands. And commands uh, are pretty easy to understand, actually. So if you wanted to read the scratch pad, you send 69 in hex and then you send, um, 
one, one plus the start address. So if, if you want to start at the beginning of the scratch pad, you send zero. If you want to start one bit in, you start zero, one, right? Pretty cool. And then one's complement of, of that guy, which is the opposite and binary of the zeros and ones. Okay, uh, so at this point, uh, we know kind of roughly what the command structure is. So I wanted to show you the one wire, uh, the actual analysis. Excuse me, I gotta switch back again to my spreadsheet. Awesome, okay. So we've got a bunch of, ran this, is, this is the whole dump of the communication. So we've got a bunch of random reset conditions at the beginning because it's, you're just powering on. And then sure enough, we see the read ROM, it reads the family. And then it goes and reads the scratch pad. So it's checking the I button to make sure that the data on the scratch pad is as, as expected. So we can see the address here, the one complement, the read, and then it just sends back a bunch of zeros because there's nothing on this scratch pad. So okay, great down. All right, now here's where it gets more interesting. They're starting to read the encrypted memory now. And we've deciphered, because now we know the read subkey command is 66. They start with the first subkey, do the ones complement, and then they, the, the slave, the I button, sends back the subkey's ID, which is actually the software version. And then we get the password in the clear. Pretty cool. So. That's the password right there that we need to read the, the whole thing. We just sniffed it right off the bus. And then, obviously, then we, now we have key data, which uh, is there, and then it goes on. It reads the second one. And surprise, surprise, they reuse the same password. <laughs> and the second ID is the date published, 99. And then it goes, and it reads the third one. And again, reuse the same password. And we have some like clear text data that was on this boot up screen, Canadian version two, we're in Canada. All right, so we understand, now that we understand the, the protocol and we have the actual password, we can do some fun things. Awesome, so I have all this information and I'm like, where do I go next? I, I obviously can't do this with Excel every time, and you can't send this out to the world and make it easy for people with Excel. So um, I have a ton of tools around my house. I've got an Arduino, I've got a bus pirate, like what do I use? So the bus pirate, I Googled it, bus pirate I button. Of course the first image that comes up is uh, someone's already done this for me. Awesome. So it's really easy to wire up. Here it is on my breadboard, uh, and it's only two wires. So. The bus part getting into a little bit more, it's a Swiss ar army knife for talking to things via serial protocols. And you'll find in anything, any ha hardware hacking you do, you're gonna use this a lot. You know, everything speaks, some, like most chips probably speak SPI, or, uh, which is serial peripheral interface, or I squared C nowadays. But one wire is used for like temperature sensors and stuff like that as well. Uh, and on their website, they call it an open source hacker multi-tool that talks to electronic stuff. You can do a lot of cool things with it. Like, you can, if you're into CPLDs, complex logic, you can program those. You can shift data out to a shift register and light up a bunch of LEDs or whatever you want to do. Uh, so here's a movie. I actually didn't want to do live demos and tempt the demo gods. Uh, so here's a, just a movie of uh, this, this the bus pirate in action, uh, reading the scratch pad and then writing to the scratch pad because I wanted to make sure, okay, is, does communication actually work in the real world now that I have all this, all these uh, passwords and stuff? So it's first in disconnected mode, that's what high Z means. And then you switch the mode over to one wire. And so it's ready and it's got a, a bunch of sub commands in the one wire mode. So we wanna give it power uh, over to the I button. So we tell it, give it five volts. And then uh, all these commands are documented as well. You can check them out on the, on the website pull up resistors because this device is parasitically powered and uh, we only want to use two cables to hook it up. And we turn the power on and we look at the saved shortcut commands in the, in the bus pirate. And one of them happens to be search for a ROM. So I issue the search for a ROM command and sure enough, it finds it on the bus. Cool. And uh, after that, we want to read the scratch pad. So 
if you notice in the Excel, you always have to reset the bus before reading, so that, that curly brace resets the bus. Then we tell it, there's only one device on the bus, so I'm talking to you, that's that skip ROM command. Then we give the actual hex 69 start address, one's complement, and then read back 64 bytes. So red, I had another I button in there that I wrote dead, uh, that I wrote dead beef to. So that's cool, it's working. And then just to prove that it's working, we, uh, we can write some more data to the scratch pad, so I'll, I'll write a little bit more here. Just change the command to 96, and we change the start address that we want to write to to the end of the dead beef, and then we put in the data. which is bad food. Everything looks okay, but we go recheck, and sure enough, it's written properly. All right, we have, we're making real progress now, and well, in my mind anyway, I'm really excited by this time because everything's working. I'm able to communicate with these I buttons. I know the password, cool. So the next step is to make it even easier. We put the uh, bus pirate into a bit bang mode, which then we can write a Python script and instead of doing all of this with type by typing and commands, we can make it reproducible, use pi serial, and just, you know, there's all these commands here. You, you wanna do a search macro, you send this, these, these bytes. You wanna send data, you send these bytes preceded by the number of bytes of data you wanna send, and so on and so forth. So it makes it a lot easier. All right, so I also wrote a Python script to dump the key, and this is the key. It's mega dump, uh, and this will actually automatically dump the key. This password is stored in the, in the script now, so you don't, have to, um, you don't have to actually put type it in, but there's, the, there's an option to add your own password. Uh, it turns out that the passwords are different for each version of uh, the actual mega touch. So um, that, that presents a complication that we'll talk about later. But we have all the correct data here, and if you looked at the spreadsheet, you'll know that you know, CAN version two is in there, and this is not random data that it's sending back to us, so we've essentially owned their, their I button at this point. Uh, so future. Uh, at this point, as I said, it's thoroughly owned. Uh, we can make copies of them. Uh, we can uh, back them up, so the bits required to, uh, to, to run these games don't go away forever. And I prefer this method to, the hardware method, rather than, you know, editing or, or uh, hacking the software so it, you know you skip the test because there's like I said there's so many versions of the software out there that uh, it would get messy after a while but there is one problem and that is apparently uh, the mega touch units check the I button serial number uh, to make sure that it's in the right range uh, or and then it won't work if it's not in the right range because they the merit the company bought like I don't know a million I buttons at once to themselves and they said you know if it's not within this range then you could probably patch that in software too, but again, getting messy. So I didn't imp bother implementing the right function because once I talked to people and learned about this, I'm like, well, it's not really uh, uh, worth it to write this, but it would be pretty simple to just implement those extra commands in there. Uh, and when I say simple, I mean like, there's only probably uh, three bytes of commands that it would take to re rewrite this to the, to the actual I button. Uh, also, they're out of production. These things are out of production now. That that pauses. Uh, that that's another problem. Uh, so it would be easier, probably, just to emulate them, them. Uh, because one wire is a really well-known protocol. So, and as you saw, there's only a few bytes in a command. So you just have to teach whatever you're whatever you're using to emulate it. Those few commands, respond to reset. Anything, any uh, um, library that's available will have the one wire protocol stuff in there already, like presence condition and, and all of that. So you just have to emu emulate the actual extra proprietary stuff that's in there. Uh, so Arduino actually has a one wire slave library. So what I thought was, all right, we'll get a Teensy LC, 10 bucks, or maybe an Adafruit Huzzah, which is based on the 8266 little micro, that's a $2 wireless micro. And you can maybe even upload buttons wirelessly, that would be pretty cool, or just by USB even, that would still be okay. 
and, uh, and then you're, you're, you're good to go. You can up, upload new keys. Maybe you could put in a web monitor for uh, the one wire bus to see, to debug in case, you know, in later versions of the software they changed how things worked, and I know they did when they got to like the 2005 versions, they used a different I button completely, so that would take a little bit more time to, um, to implement. But also, uh, you could easily use, you could easily add to this a sniffer function where if you just flick a switch on the board, hook it up in between the probes like I did, uh, it would just copy the current key, then you can take the key out switch it back into the other mode and it's got its personality or that's what it's gonna that's what it's gonna emulate. Clone mode, so to speak. So I didn't get to this point yet because all of this other stuff took up a lot of my time and I also have a real job and <laughs> my wife would be mad uh, if I didn't get paid. So I'm I'm moving there, but all of the software you saw is on my GitHub already. Uh, so you can take a look at, at what I did. Uh, I am going to do this because uh, I've actually had a few aficionados reach out to me and say, this is cool stuff. I, my mega touches were broken. I always thought that, uh, you know, they, they said that there's no way to copy these things. They're encrypted. And it's like, okay, well, let's, let's fix that. Uh, so I did do a little bit of work on the software side too because, of course, when, when you're doing this hardware stuff, it's really hard to work kind of in isolation because these things interact really closely. So sometimes you need to answer questions about what the heck's going on. And uh, for that, my buddy Jer here helped me out a little bit on the software side. I'm not so hot with Ida, so uh, I got him to load it up and take a look at stuff. But what I did do was, like, I can use grep, that's for sure. <laughs> and I looked for the key inside of all of the mega touch files, and there was like 2,000 references to the key in clear text <laughs> in, uh, in the hard drive. So that's pretty cool. And I was like, why are they putting the key in, in there? And the actual payload, like the encrypted stuff, was in the DLLs as well. Uh, so we found, and if you can't, that, that function in there calls fudge security. <laughs> so, so there's two versions. There's DOS, and that's the one we were playing with. And then they moved over to Linux, uh, 90, maybe 2000 at some point. So we were looking at the DOS stuff because uh, that's the, the box I had, and the hardware is kind of flaky, and I didn't want to screw around with <laughs> trying to up update it. And it all takes a lot of time. So uh, yeah, we found this, and we realized, I think, um, they didn't want to go back and do a key read, uh, or they didn't know what what key it was. So they, they stored the key for when they're at storing, I think, high scores on this guy. And so they just fake security then. So in, in this particular version, you could, you could pretty easily circumvent the copy protection by just reading the key out of the files. But that's changed in, in later versions. They don't fudge security in every file, I don't think. <laughs> But uh, that was kind of funny. And I, I want to do some more research into the software side, as, as I said, but uh, I haven't, just haven't got there yet. So that's all I have uh, for today on Hacking the Megatouch. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your attention and for coming. And this stuff is on GitHub. My GitHub is there. Uh, but it's under heavy construction. But if you have any questions, like file a, a ticket or whatever, and we'll, we'll chat about it. Uh, I'll put the I button cloning stuff up there too when I'm done and uh, happy hacking everyone. Does anyone have any questions? All right, thanks oh, very much. I got one. Oh, wait. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, did you do like with your own device that you'd bought, did you have a look at any uh, sort of hardware bypasses for the coin mechanism to, so you don't have to constantly drop in coins in your own machine? I didn't play around with that. I think, I think it was broke, actually. So yeah, I was really hoping they had a bill collector on it so I could take a look at the bill collectors too and how that thing worked, but uh, yeah, I haven't got there yet. but at least the later firmware have a setting for free play in the menu. So no hacking required. Yeah, so you know them pretty well, eh? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Any, anything else? All right, thanks again, everyone. It was a blast.